Reproduction in animals can be a complex process involving a wide range of behaviors, from territoriality and courtship, through copulation and gestation, to birthing and giving parental care. Some animals will undertake the full range of these behaviors, and yet others may contribute to just one step in the process. Whatever the reproductive strategy of the animals in question, the behaviors have evolved to optimize the adaptive value of the process and to improve the reproductive success of those animals by ensuring that their genes find their way into the next generation and beyond. The bowerbird of Australia has a unique courtship in which the male will construct a complex vertical structure known as a bower to impress the females into mating with him. The bowers vary by species, but are knit together using sticks and twigs from the forest and are decorated by colorful objects that he can find in his environment, like flowers and berries. They seem to have a strong preference for yellow and blue decorations. Once his display is complete, he will sing for females to come and check him out and to judge his creation. The females are very choosy and will take note of his size and the brightness of his plumage as well as the quality and decor of his bower construction. It better be impressive, because her choice will be based entirely on his ability to show off a fine physique and an attractive bower display. Each female will mate only once with the best male that she can find, and then will leave to undertake all of the rest of the reproductive process by herself, including building a nest and caring for the chicks. The male's contribution to reproduction equates to donating a few millimeters of sperm, and that's all. However, if he has an impressive body and bower, he may be chosen by several females and be able to sire offspring in many different nests in his forest. How is it that such a courtship display could evolve in the bower birds, where male birds offer no assistance whatsoever to the females for reproduction? It is because he's only offering his genes that the females are evaluating signs of his genetic quality. Because bowers are so difficult to construct, as well as to maintain against competing males that will destroy them if they can, an impressive bower is a sign of intelligence, creativity, and strength in its creator. Also, by looking at his body size and the brightness of his plumage, the female bower birds can get information about his developmental history and his current health status. Males that have been plagued by illness or parasites just simply cannot produce big bodies with brightly colored feathers. By evaluating the quality of a bower and its male maker, the female birds do therefore get an honest reflection of the quality of that male bird's genes. Given that's all she's getting from him, it's important to make a good decision to ensure that her offspring will also have the best genes possible. For the male birds that are found to be attractive specimen with impressive bowers, the rewards will be high and he will enjoy a lot of successful matings. In cases like the bower birds, where competition is high for access to the limited mating opportunities that come around, we tend to find sexual strategies that allow a sorting of the quality of suitors, such that the choosy sex can make an informed decision about the best mates to pick. Typically, we find that males compete for reproductive opportunities with choosy females, because the costs of mating are lower in males. At the minimum, some males only provide sperm, which is cheap for them to produce, but female investments into reproduction are generally much higher. Eggs are larger and energetically more expensive to produce. Gestation or incubation of the developing embryos often falls to the female as one of her roles, not to mention her postnatal contributions in the form of parental care. Since female animals generally invest so much more into reproduction, 
They have much more to lose by making a bad choice when mating. We find that this asymmetry in the contribution to reproduction leads to dramatically different sexual strategies between male and female animals. Generally speaking, males can maximize their reproductive success by having more matings, but females are better off trying to increase the quality of their offspring because they're limited in the number that they can produce. As such, male animals tend to be promiscuous when it comes to their sexual strategies, and females tend to be more careful and choosier. When this intersexual selection for mates is strong, it can lead to the evolution of dramatic displays where the males will produce challenging and costly ornaments of some kind, and the females will choose their mates based on the quality of those displays. This is particularly true when males provide little or no parental care, and the value of assessing the quality of his genes becomes paramount in importance. In social animals, hierarchies can develop among males competing for the top position, which will come with lots of reproductive opportunities. These hierarchies are usually determined through fighting and jousting, with the help of armaments like horns and antlers. By sorting out the males into a gradient of high to low quality, this intrasexual selection pre-sorts the males and the females do not need to make a choice. The females will automatically prefer the dominant males because of their obvious quality, having won the competition among all the other males. Whether it is the displays of ornaments in the case of intersexual selection, or the fighting with armaments with intrasexual selection, they're both processes that have evolved by natural selection to rank the suitors along the axis of individual quality, such that those looking to choose a mate can make the best and most adaptive choice possible. The general rule of females being choosy and males being promiscuous in their attitudes towards sexual reproduction holds in most cases. But there are exceptions. And I don't just mean those sitcoms where some slob of a comedian is married to a beautiful woman. In the natural world, males tend to become more and more choosy about who they mate with when their contribution to reproduction increases. One important investment that males can make is in offering parental care. Males of many species of animals contribute to the care of their offspring. And this behavior may range from mouth brooding of fry and fish, piggyback care of tadpoles and frogs, or feeding behavior of young chicks and birds, for example. When male contributions to reproduction get so large that they limit how often he can reproduce, we find in extreme examples that the sex roles become reversed, with females tending to become more promiscuous and males becoming quite choosy about their potential mates. This is especially true for the Mormon cricket, which is a katydid, so it's neither a cricket nor a Mormon as far as I can tell. However, in this species of insect, the male offers a nutrient-rich spermatophore, or sperm package, to the female upon mating, that she will consume to nourish the eggs in development. These large spermatophore donations upon mating can be up to a quarter of the body weight of the male crickets, meaning that he doesn't have many of these to go around. At best, he may be able to mate successfully with two females, but most may only have one chance at it. As a result, the male Mormon crickets are very particular about which females they will mate with, and will only choose the highest quality females to make his important donation towards his single chance at reproduction. Incidentally, the spermatophore becomes lodged in the female's genital tract, with the nutritious portion sticking out for her to feed upon while the sperm migrate inwards to fertilize her eggs. This has the effect of removing her from the mating game with other males until she can clear her genital opening of the spermatophore plug. It also buys the male donor some time to become the father of her offspring before she may attempt to remate with a different male, causing him to lose paternity after his precious and expensive copulatory gift was given. In species like this one, where the females may attempt to mate with multiple males in order to benefit from all of their material contributions, a curious phenomenon exists 
where the male competition for reproduction may continue on the inside of her reproductive tract. This situation, where the sperm from more than one male may find themselves in the same female's body, leads to a situation where those sperm continue to compete for access to her ovules. Sperm competition is so common in animals that have these polyandrous mating systems, or ones where females will attempt to mate with more than one male per reproductive period, that evolution has favored adaptations that allow some males to be better equipped at winning than others. In some cases, it could be by increasing the size of their testes, so that the amount of sperm deposited per ejaculate would be so large as to win the competition via a shock and awe approach. In other cases, later coming males might try to remove some of the sperm deposited by any males that may have come before them. Such is the case with black-winged damselflies. These insects have a particular mating procedure that starts out with males establishing and defending territories of emergent vegetation next to fresh water like a stream or pond. The females will choose to mate with a vigorous male with good access to the water for her to lay her eggs in. In these insects, however, the females have lots of eggs to go around and will attempt to mate with as many males as they can. Something that the mating males don't want to have happen and they have many tricks to make sure that her eggs are fertilized by him alone. Firstly, the males have claspers on their abdomens that they use to hold on to a receptive female by the back of the neck. Once she is ready to mate, she will bring her abdomen around and link up their genitalia in this lovely heart-shaped position. It's what's happening on the inside that gives this male the advantage on ensuring his own paternity over that of other males. The male damselfly's penis is equipped with inverted barbs and brushes that scoop out and remove any sperm that may have been deposited in her reproductive tract prior to this male's mating attempt. When he inserts his own penis, this chimney sweep approach is sure to make clear winners and losers of the sperm competition. I guess the expression, first come, first served, does not always hold true. After copulation is completed, the male keeps his hold on the female and they fly around in tandem while she dips her abdomen in the water and lays those recently fertilized eggs. In this way, the recently mated male can prevent his female partner from remating with another male and having his own sperm load cleaned out before it can fertilize her ovules. By continuing the mate guarding after copulation, these males follow through on the sperm competition and don't leave the race until they can be sure that their offspring have been produced and are out there in the world. By guarding their mates, some males may attempt to avoid the sperm competition altogether. Whether it is a big-horned ram keeping other males away from his females, or a warbler songbird that tries to prevent his female mate from flying off to have affairs with neighboring males in the territory, mate guarding is an effective way of ensuring one's own paternity over that of others. Given that sexual selection has evolved in order to allow both males and females to be able to find the best quality mate among the range available in the population, we might get the impression that only the strongest and most attractive of both sexes actually ever get any chances to pass their genes along to the next generation. In some instances, lower quality individuals find a way to get in on the mating action, even though they could never win the competition by the regular rules, either because they lack the attractive display or they can't outfight the dominant males. These so-called loser males don't try to compete in the traditional manner, instead opting for alternative mating strategies. The marine iguanas of the Galapagos Islands live in groups where harems of females are protected and controlled by a dominant male. The subordinate males can't court and copulate with any of the protected females before he gets dismounted by the dominant male, thus preventing his chances at mating. Unless he pre-ejaculates in his cloaca in private beforehand, and all he has to do is to get a quick mount on a female to transfer his sperm load for fertilization. By using this pre-ejaculation alternative strategy, 
the subordinate males find a way to get some reproductive access to the females, who are otherwise inaccessible except to the alpha males. We all know that the quality of an animal and their ability to compete against others will not be constant over time. Some will need time to become strong and mature before they can enter the competitive arena. And on the other end of the sequence, animals will weaken and lose their vigor after their peak and as they get older. Because of this varying physical condition and ability over one's life, many animals will adopt a conditional strategy to reproduction depending on their current state and chances of competing. This is especially true for animals that mate through external fertilization, like amphibia, and horseshoe crabs. When mating time comes around, the males may compete to mount and hold on to a female until she is ready to release her eggs for fertilization. The optimal place to be for maximal fertilization of her eggs is in the amplexus position, seen here in frogs, where the primary male is first in line to fertilize her eggs as she begins to release them. However, there may be some eggs that escape unfertilized by that primary male, and that's where these satellite males come in. These other males have decided for one reason or another not to attempt to become the primary and attached male, but they would hang around nearby as satellites and hope to be able to fertilize some eggs when the action begins. By assessing their ability, or lack thereof, to win the prime position, these males opt for a conditional strategy that will give them the best of a bad situation, where fertilizing some eggs is better than none at all. We've seen that sexual selection has allowed for the development of a sorting process, where those animals that are attractive and have a high market value can find the best quality mates. At the same time, those animals that are not able to compete at that high level still manage to enter the competition and do what all organisms are programmed to do. Pass its genes along to the next generation and not find itself in the position that no animal wants to be in, an evolutionary dead end.